Hi there, and welcome to the QMNet seminar series. I'm Patrick Lorb, and I'm filling in for Michael Zephyr while he uh, can't make this this week again. And our speaker today is Martin Picard, who has a PhD, uh, sorry, received his uh, BSc honors in neuroimmunology and PhD in mitochondrial biology of aging at McGill University. He's moved to, he then moved to University of Pennsylvania for a postdoctoral fellowship in the Center of Mitochondrial and Epigenetic Medicine with Doug Wallace. And there he worked on mitochondria, mitochondria interactions, mitochondrial reprogramming of the nuclear epigenome, mitochondrial stress pathophysiology, along with Bruce McEwen at the Rockefeller University, and uh, has joined the faculty at Columbia University in 2015. And uh, I'm looking forward to his talk today and thanks for joining us at such an hour time difference. My pleasure. Yes, thank you. I'm glad the, the time difference is, is so extreme that it makes this possible. <laughs> We're just uh, on different days, which is quite nice. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited. I, I, I was uh, looking at the QMNet series, uh, a lot of fantastic content there. And I think one team that uh, connects what's happening in your, your seminar series and the kind of work that we do is very much at the intersection of disciplines. Um, and we think there's, there's a lot to gain there. So, and what we've been doing and what I'm going to tell you about today is the portion of our work that straggles biology and psychology. And really our, our goal is to understand principles of health, right? What keeps people healthy? Uh, we know quite a bit about disease. If you look at the, the fraction of the research budget that's allocated for <laughs> disease research, disease-based you know, research, it's the majority of, of the, the NIH budget in the US and you know, I think of pretty much any funding agency in comparison, we know so little about health, right? What's the basis of, of health and resilience and what allows people to, to remain healthy for decades? Uh, so we're trying to understand this from a, an energetic perspective. And I'll tell you a little bit uh, why we think that's, that's uh, an important angle and uh, a useful hypothesis to pursue. So the, really the, the key premise is that energy is what sustains life and actually powers everything that we call stress responses. Um, and if we look at a very you know, high level, fundamentally, every life form on the planet is powered by the sun, right? So there's energy coming in the form of sun rays that's captured by plants through photosynthesis. And then that makes oxygen and that makes food substrates, right? starch, glucose, um, and what happens in the, the human body is that we breathe oxygen, right? That comes from energy from the sun through the plant. And we eat the food substrates, either directly from the plants or directly through animals, right? And then in the mitochondria, those two things are combined and then they make cellular energy, the ATP, which is the, the cellular energy currency. Uh, and what comes out chemically of the mitochondria is carbon dioxide, CO2, and water. Uh, these are the two byproducts of flowing electrons to the elect electron transport chain that come from the food substrate. Oxygen is the electron acceptor, and then that powers life. And interestingly, uh, CO2 and water, you know, as, as everyone will know, is exactly what the plants need to, you know, make oxygen food substrate. You need to water your plant and they eat up the CO2 in, in the atmosphere. Um, so there's this like fundamental connection between mitochondrial energy production in every one of our cells and just how life on the planet is powered. And there's a whole evolutionary history that I won't go into, but where mitochondria were originally bacteria and then were in incorporated into what's called endosymbiosis. And that made multicellular life possible. So the reason there are not just single cells and bacteria on the planet, but there are you know, thinking, feeling, a conscious organisms like humans on the planet is because mitochondria and, and evolutionary history. Uh, so without going too deep on, on that route, let's think about what this means for the human body. And we think a lot about the ability of the organism to adapt, right? To adapt to stressors. And stressors is broadly defined waking up in the morning. <laughs> so going from the sleeping state to the awake state is a stressor, 
right? There's a, a whole lot of changes that happen in the organism. Uh, metabolic rate increases, your heart rate increases from sleep to wake. There's hormones that increase. I'll tell you a bit about this later. Uh, so waking up is a stressor, getting a, a, you know, an aggravating email is a stressor, <laughs> getting up on your bike or going up the stairs is a stressor. So all of these things are stressors and stressors can be of different kinds, right? They can be auditory. You hear something visual stressors can be metabolic. They can be real or imagined. To some extent, it doesn't matter if you think you're in danger or you're, if you're actually in danger. Um, physiologically, the, the response can be very similar and can be emotional, pathogen, physical injury. So all of those things are things from the outside, right? That converge on the human organism and we, we have the ability to sense. The reason we can sense those stressors, right? The reason we're different than a rock, right? Or a chair, which wouldn't, care less about these things in the environment is because we're moved by energy, right? Because we're alive. Uh, and because we're energized, then information from the outside we can perceive. And then that information is integrated with information that is held inside the organism. And that information is contained in the form of circulating hormones, right? That tell you about the state of the organism in the form of DNA, right? And the genetic code, the epigenome, stuff that's written on top of the genome, existing proteins and anything that holds memories of past exposures. So we hold that information in our organism and then stuff from the outside comes in. The ability of those two things, kind of our endogenous biology and the outside stuff, the stressors, for these things to interact, there needs to be an energized interface, right? There needs to be life. And that's where energy comes from. And that's how we think about the role of energy that comes from mitochondria uh, having on, on the organism. So let's, let's talk about mitochondria a little bit. Where are they? What are they? Um, well, they're in every cell of the organism except one cell type. Some of you might know which cell type in the human body does not have mitochondria. So the red blood cells, right, that carry oxygen in the blood don't have mitochondria because their role is to transport oxygen to, to the other cells. And if they had mitochondria, they would consume the, the oxygen, presumably. Uh, so every cell in the organism, uh, except red blood cells, has mitochondria. And uh, cells that need more energy, right? The, for example, the heart is always pumping, requires a lot of energy for this. The brain, always constant neural activity, requires energy. These tissues have lots of mitochondria, so high mitochondrial content. And tissues with lower energy demand, like white blood cells, PBMCs, or liver kind of intermediate have fewer mitochondria. So the, the, the amount of mitochondria scales with energy demand. And the, the mitochondrion is singular for mitochondria. The mitochondrion is the only organelle in the cell to have its own genome. And that relates to their evolutionary origin as bacteria, right? So they have a circular genome called a plasmid, uh, which all bacteria do. So they've kept that as a vestige of their, their bacterial ancestry. Uh, and most of you will know mitochondria as producer of energy, uh, so ATP synthesis, but they do a lot of other things, including producing reactive oxygen species, right? They can cause oxidative stress. Uh, calcium regulation, calcium is a very important intracellular signal. Mitochondria do a lot of calcium uptake and calcium release. Uh, they can trigger cell death. So mitochondria basically have a beto on whether the cell lives or dies. And that's because it contains molecules, proteins that if released cause cell death. So the healthy pool of mitochondria will keep those inside. When the mitochondria are under too much stress, they release those factors and then the cell commits suicide, apoptosis. And I'll tell you a bit about mitochondria. They actually produce hormones. Uh, so the, the picture of mitochondria that some of you might have as you know, mitochondria as the powerhouse or energy producer is a little outdated. And I would argue the, the powerhouse analogy is, is not only outdated, it's expired. And uh, really, it's actually misleading because you know, analogies are very strong. They tap into this, this basis of human knowledge. And then you think powerhouse, you think a machine, you, know, you think something that makes energy. Mitochondria have a whole life cycle. They reproduce, they move around, they fuse, they exchange information. Um, those are, they're, they're much more than a little mechanical engine. So in the context of thinking about the cell, the environment, right? This is kind of where mitochondria are positioned. There is here the schematic of a human cell. 
In the middle is a nucleus with the, the chromosome and the telomeres at the end, those little red parts that shrink as cells age. And then those little orange squiggles in the cytoplasm are the mitochondria. And you can see there, they lie in between, right? Topologically or, or physically, they're in between the nucleus, the genome, and the environment. So if there is a stressor or some information coming from the outside that eventually is going to reach a nucleus to change gene expression, for example, that information needs to pass through the mitochondrial network. And there's some evidence that mitochondria are equipped with a variety of receptors to sense information from the outside, integrate that information, and then produce signals that change gene expression. This is a, a picture, and uh, it's an electron micrograph, right, that illustrates the same thing as the, this cartoon, but this is real. This is like a real human cell where you see the nucleus, and I added a little pictogram there of the, of the chromosome, but the dark, big things in the nucleus are the, the condensed chromatin and the, the, the DNA that's compacted. And you see the mitochondria there that are in between the outside world in green and, uh, and the nucleus in blue. And we did a study a few years ago when I was in, uh, in Doug Wallace's lab where we had cells uh, that are called cybrids, where you basically, you have a number of cells that are like genetically identical twins. They came from exactly the same cell, but then you, you make twins of them, and then you can change the proportion of mitochondrial DNA defects, right? Because one cell, as you can see, has one nucleus, half the genome from mom, half the genome from dad, and then all the mitochondria in the cytoplasm come from only one parent, and they come from the mother, right? So all the mitochondria are maternally inherited. And then each of those little orange mitochondria in the cytoplasm here probably have one copy of the mitochondrial DNA. And if you look at the whole cell in three dimension, there's hundreds of mitochondria. So there's hundreds of copies of mitochondrial DNA, that little circular plasmid, for in each cell. And what happens in human disease, for example, is that there can be a portion of the mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA that have a mutation. Right? They have, either there's a point mutation or there's a chunk of DNA, mitochondrial DNA missing, called it deletion. Uh, and the level of those mutation and deletion can cause disease in humans. We've known deaths for about 30 years now. Uh, so what we did was to have cells that are all genetically identical, but they have different levels of the mutation. And then you can do an experiment where you basically experimentally manipulate the mitochondrial dysfunction, right, to the level of mitochondrial health, and you ask what changes, right, what effect does that have on whatever you're interested in. And in this case, we did RNA sequencing, and we asked, what effect does this have on gene expression, right? So you sequence the whole transcriptome, all of the RNA molecules in the cell, and then you, you can look at the expression of about 25,000 genes. What we found in that study, which was a little surprising, is that over two thirds of the whole human genome was somehow either upregulated or downregulated. So it was regulated by mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> the majority of genes in the human genome are under mitochondrial or energetic regulation. So this tells you, I think, a little bit how important energy is for the cell, right? That so much of the genome is tailored, the activity is tailored to how much energy or how healthy the mitochondria are. And if you think about it, maybe this makes sense, because if you're a cell and you're about to divide, you don't want to start dividing if there's nothing, not enough energy to complete cell division, because that would be pretty catas catastrophic. Uh, so you need the cell to be aware of the energetic context, right, and its energetic state in order to adapt its behavior. So speaking of behavior, we think a lot about mitochondrial behavior, and there's uh, something that's ubiquitous across multiple strata of life, eh? and that's social behavior. So in humans, right, you can think about playing sports, or having a department or a lab or a family, right? There are different levels of social organizations that require that people talk to each other, right? Communication, um, you know, personal relationships, all have heavily dependent on good communication. <laughs> uh, but there's all sorts of domains of human activity that requires communication and has this social quality. Uh, that's also well described in uh, insects, ants, right, which operate as communities and they talk to each other through hormones and pheromones. Um, and one ant can influence the behavior of you know, a number of ants and, and so on. And 
the ants have a number of, of characteristics, like some ants that are genetically identical, develop very big bodies and they become the guardians of the, of the colony. Some ants are super small and they, these are the worker ants and they go very far forage and everything. Um, so there's this kind of specialization and uh, sharing of tasks, right? Like in human society, some people specialize in being researchers, some people specialize in making food, some people specialize in making airplanes. <laughs> And that's necessary so that we can do everything we do. And so ants do the same thing, they distribute tasks and they specialize. And you see the same thing at the cellular level, right? In the human body, not every cell does the same thing. You have liver cells that specialize in detoxifying stuff and making glucose. Cells in the brain specialize in processing information. Cells in the heart specialize in contracting and you know, moving blood around. And it's only through the collaboration, the cooperation between the different cell types, between the different organs that we're alive and, and we are what we are. So, and, and that is very similar. There's a lot of similar features with this social behavior where the, the cooperation, the working together is necessary, the communication. Um, and we reviewed the literature recently and asked, what about mitochondria, right? If you look at their behavior, well, these are six hallmarks of social creatures and social behavior. One, sharing a similar environment, right? Mitochondria share the same cell, so that fulfills this criteria. Uh, communication, mitochondria talk to each other through various means, either through soluble signals, diffusible signals, or through physical contact. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this today, but we identified tubular structures. Basically, they extend the cable from one another, and then they can exchange information through this. Physically, they can come together and align their internal structures or Christi. So they exchange uh, information through both physical and non-physical means. Um, so that's, and ha that happens all the time in the cell cytoplasm. Group formation, all social creatures do this. They congregate in groups. <laughs> uh, mitochondria also do this. They congregate in groups in different parts of the cell. Synchronization of behavior, we do this. Ants do this, cells do this. Mitochondria also do this. Functional interdependence, Right, you can't do everything. There needs to be, um, you, you need help from other partners to, to accomplish something. A mitochondria do this. And specialization and division of labor. Like I mentioned, mitochondria also do this. So in the same cell, their mitochondria do something that are, let's say, close to the synapse. They're very good at picking up calcium and so on. Mitochondria near the nucleus probably play a different role. And mitochondria in different cell types also play different roles. So this is, this is starting to make us think about mitochondria again, not as a powerhouse, but as a, a dynamic, you know, living microorganism inside every cell of the organism. This is what mitochondria look like. If you look at them under the microscope, you make them fluorescent with a probe so you can see them. Uh, and then you do a time lapse, right? You take pictures very quickly. The, does this movie play well? Can you guys see this? Yeah. Uh, so what you can see, for example, here at the beginning, there are these two mitos, and then these come together, and there's, there's this third one that comes in, and then the third one kind of hangs out, and then at some point it says, okay, I've had enough, and then boom, you know, it loops back where it came from. You see this guy, then it's going to loop back and then leave. Uh, these, when these mitochondria come together, they form what's called intermitochondrial junctions, and we know there's information being exchanged there. So this is a kind of little social behavior, right? Almost insect-like. And this is sped up about uh, seven times. Um, so in, in reality, they move barely fast enough so the human eye and human perception can perceive the movement. Um, but they're, so that's accelerated so you can actually see the, the dynamics. And the different color here is just the depth. So the blue mitochondria are at the bottom of the cell and the red mitochondria are at the top and the, the, the other colors are in between. So it's just the the depth perception that's color coded here. So you can see how dynamic they are, right? And when I trained as a student, <laughs> the textbook picture of mitochondria are little beans. They're little beans and you know they're are peanut shaped depending on your preference and they're pretty static. So now I think the field is moving towards a much more dynamic understanding of mitochondria. And we're realizing they actually form networks, right? So here's a an example of uh, or cartoon of a cell with the nucleus and then the mitochondrial network and their points of contact between mitochondria um, and their intracellular mitochondrial networks that can either come together or be co or collapse depending on this this stress say, state of the cell and similarly uh, like I was mentioning your mitochondria in different organs in the body 
that send signals to each other, right? So we can start to think of mitochondria as networks, just not just only within a cell, but mitochondria talking to each other between cells, between organs. Uh, so that leads to the concept of physiological mitochondrial networks. And I'll give an example of this. So I think it's, we can, I think we could argue whether mitochondria are really social, uh, but in terms of, as a theoretical framework, and in terms of fulfilling key criteria for social behavior, they tick a lot of boxes. Uh, and that's a useful framework we've found, right? Where the, every model or every theory is only so good as it helps you progress in your thinking and, uh, and, and, and as long as it's testable in some ways. Uh, and so far the, the hypothesis of mitochondria are social organelles has been very fruitful to kind of help us think beyond the powerhouse. Uh, so what's an example of mitochondria talking to other mitochondria? Well, one very good example uh, is that the mitochondrial production of glucocorticoids and stress hormones and sex hormones. So the, about five years ago, I did not know that uh, steroid hormones are made in mitochondria. And from my uh, chatting with colleagues, I think no more than 5% of biologists are aware that the most important hormones arguably in the body Right, that allow sexual differentiation reproduction, right? What allows it, the female body to, to be pregnant is estrogen, progesterone. Uh, those are steroid hormones that are made in mitochondria. Uh, testosterone, which allows you to make sperm and, and you know, to be a male if you happen to be a male. Testosterone is made in mitochondria in the testes. And uh, cortisol, which is a hormone that allows res to respond to stress without collapsing, uh, is also made in mitochondria in the adrenal glands. And that's poorly appreciated in, in biology, but evolutionary speaking, why would you put the synthesis of the most important hormones in the human body inside this organelle? There's other places where this could happen. So there, there has to be a good reason, and we don't know the reason to that. Uh, but briefly, this is how a cortisol is made. And it all starts with cholesterol coming into the mitochondria through a protein called STAR. And then there's this side chain cleavage enzyme, uh, a few enzymatic reactions in the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum back to mitochondria and then cortisol is made. And that happens in the adrenal gland in the adrenal cortex specifically. And this is an electron micrograph of mitochondria in brown here and in purple is the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is just gorgeous mitochondria with all of their Christi, all of the lines across you see. This is where the, uh, the membrane potential, this is where oxygen is consumed. Right? The reason we breathe is to bring oxygen to those little membranes there so mitochondria can be energized, so they can produce hormone, they can produce energy, and so on. So uh, one idea that has emerged also from this line of thinking is that mitochondria are actually signal processing units. So if we think as an analogy about brain and, and neural networks, right? what the brain does is that it has the ability to take sensory input through the senses, right, the ears, the eyes, the, the mouth, and so on. So there's sensory input coming in, and then there's signal integration and processing through synaptic plasticity, and there's memory formation. And all of this, as far as we know, happens through the interaction between neurons, the interaction between brain networks, between brain regions, and so on. And, and the purpose of doing this, the, the reason the brain has evolved, is that then it can generate an intelligent output terms, you know, neural hormones, and then coordinate the organism's function, right? So it, it, it enhances survival because you compute information like, hey, what should I do for my survival? Is it cold? Is it hot? Do I need to eat or not? Um, so centrally, you know, the brain um, accomplished a lot of these tasks. What plays this role in the cell? And uh, there's this beautiful quote here by Herbert Weiner in a book called Perturbing the Organism, where he says, the organism is integrated into a larger system of information exchange, right? Information is exchanged all the time everywhere. The brain and the rest of the organism are not qualitatively different in their ability to compute, process information, but show only quant qualitative differences in their purposiveness. And I think what he's saying here is that everything in the body computes information, but the brain does it, you know, in one way, but other parts of the body also process and compute information and might do it in a different way. So I would suggest that mitochondria inside the cell do a very similar thing. They process and receive metabolic endocrine inputs, they monitor energy levels, 
And then through their interaction, their network structure inside the cell, they might have the ability to, to process and integrate information and maybe form memories, right? We don't quite know. Uh, and then it, as an output, mitochondria generate signals. Like I told you, they can regulate up to two thirds, two thirds of the human genome under mitochondrial regulation. And we know some of the mechanism, I'm not gonna get into this, but mitochondria basically speak the language of the epigenome that can open up and close genes and, uh, and modulate gene expression. So we did a, a study about uh, five, six years ago now, where we wanted to know what's the influence of this on physiology, right? In a living organism, if you change the mitochondria, do you change how the body responds, processes information, and responds to stress? Uh, and to study this, we used a mouse model, multiple mouse models. Uh, so these are little animals that have the same genome, essentially. They're the same strain, but we might manipulate a genetically manipulated the mitochondria. So that allows you uh, to control for a lot of factors uh, and change just one thing, which is the mitochondria. And then we, and the, the green and the yellow mice here, the ND6, the CO1, these are subunit of an energy production system in the mitochondria, the, the electron transport chain. ANT1 allows energy exchange, ATP through the uh, inside of, and outside of the mitochondria. And NNT is nicotinic, nicotinamide nucleotide transhydrogenase, which allows mitochondria to get rid of reactive oxygen species inside the mitochondria. So we're basically manipulating mitochondria in four different ways, right? four qualitatively different ways and asking, how does this change how an organism, a whole animal perceives a, a stressor, a challenge, and then responds to it, right? Mobilizes kind of an, an intelligent whole organism response to that challenge. And the challenge we use is um, uh, basically putting the mouse into a small closed space so you put the mouse into a tube, there are holes so it can breathe, but it's stuck there. So it can't get out. Uh, and the neuroendocrine response to this has been studied for about 30 years now. And it's very similar to the neuroendocrine response that we see in humans who need to do something that's psychologically stressful. <laughs> so like giving a talk, for example, right? If you're, you, stand, you uh, stand in front of a like 300 people audience and then of your peers, and then you're worried that they're going to judge you. So this, this is called so, uh, social evaluative stress, right? Or psychosocial stress. And this is used heavily in the, the psychoneuroendocrinology, uh, psychoneuroimmunology literature and uh, the field where you have people give a speech in front of evaluators and then the cortisol increases, heart rate increases. There's this beautiful whole body response. So the way to mimic this in mice, because they're not super vulnerable to public speaking, is to do this uh, physical restraint procedure. So we just use whatever the field was using, right? Which is th this uh, restraint. And then we ask what happens to, let's say stress hormones, right? Corticosterone, which is the mouse version of cortisol in humans. So uh, this is made in the mitochondria. This is what happens in black if you just stress the mouse for 30 minutes. So you, you stress the mouse for 30 minutes and you release it. So you can see the reactivity to stress and then the recovery. So for 30 minutes, you get this nice induction of corticosterone, and then during the subsequent hour and a half, there's a nice recovery. Now the blue line is what happens if you impair energy transfer between the mitochondria and the cytoplasm, right? There's a doubling of the corticosterone response. So just by changing the mitochondria, you, you magnify the response of this hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that makes corticosterone, the HP axis by two. And, and if you introduce this other mitochondrial defect, NNT, which causes mitochondrial oxidative stress, you blunt this response by 50%, right? We're not talking 10, 20%, we're talking doubling or halving of the stress response just by changing the mitochondria. Uh, so this is one of the things that we assess in terms of physiological reactivity. And then you can take the delta from baseline to let's say the peak at 30 minutes, and then you can you know, have a magnitude of response. And then you can take, okay, from the peak to 120, so the recovery. So then this is two parameters. So in total, we analyzed 72 parameters from these, uh, 74 parameters from these, from these mice. So you see this is a heat map that shows you the fold change. So uh, sorry, the color uh, scale bar is full change uh, compared to um, a Z-score, right? So it's, it's a 
yeah, relative change. So compared to the wild type, the mice with the normal mitochondria on the left, you can see that the mice with the electron transport chain defects, MD6, CO1, and then ANT1, NNT, the mice that are shown at the top with the abnormal corticosterone response, each of them mobilizes a different stress response signature. Right? So each row here, one of them is cortisol increase, and one of them is cortisol recovery, and so on. Um, and we looked at catecholamines, at uh, immune markers uh, in interleukin-6. We did prote uh, metabolomics to look at amino acids and so on. Um, and then this is kind of a, a bit of a messy picture. What you can do is to, to reduce the dimension of those 74 features is a uh, principal component analysis. And then you can the, distill the stress response in two major components. And in this case, the PCM model actually captures almost 75% of the variance. Right, component one about fifty percent, component two about twenty five percent, and what this shows here is that relative to the wild type, so the mice with the normal mitochondria, the WT, you can see that if you cause mitochondrial oxidative stress, you shift the stress response, right, the whole organism response top left, but if you impair energy transfer, you shift the stress response completely opposite, down and right. And if you impair energy production capacity, you shift the stress response to the, towards the right, right? So this is a multivariate analysis of the stress response in animals where mitochondria was manipulated. So this was surprising <laughs> and, uh, you know, showed, I think, pretty convincingly in vivo in a living organism that changing the mitochondria can change either how the stress is perceived and or how it's processed and then how it materializes physiologically. Um, so when I, a few, a couple years later, I started at Columbia and then now, we, since then, we've been running a human study, which is the, the human translation of this mouse study where we recruit people with either normal mitochondria, wild type, or we have access, we're extremely fortunate to have access to a population of patients with genetic defects in their mitochondria. So, and it, it causes mitochondrial disease. So we can ask with a similar degree of, um, of specificity, genetic specificity, what's the effect of mitochondrial uh, defects on the integrated stress response. So we bring people in, we give them this so social evaluative challenge, you know, we stress them <laughs> and we draw blood at multiple time points and saliva and we measure physiology. So it's also a multivariate and uh, multi-omic study of stress reactivity and basically asking if this is also the case in humans. And we think that might help explain why people are fundamentally different. Because uh, there's so far, just looking at the nuclear genome and looking at, you know, doing GWAS and, and other kind of studies has not revealed the source of human variation. Uh, and the hypothesis that we're following here is that part of why people are so different and part of why people respond differently to, to stress and to challenge. I think everyone knows this. Some, something that makes me, uh, my body, or, you know, um, struggle might not affect, you know, another person. And we all have slightly different neuroendocrine and uh, hormonal responses. Uh, so and we think that might be because people have different mitochondria and different mitochondrial properties. So I'm going to switch gear a little bit now. Um, and this, um, this, I think is supposed to summarize everything that we've talked about so far, right? Where this is a bit of a mitocentric uh, worldview, but <laughs> we think there's some basis to this. You have the mitochondria there that produce energy, right? That speak with the nucleus. Uh, and then at the intracellular level, there's this social life that basically influences how cells function and how cells talk to each other. And then the ability of cells to talk to each other ultimately determines the ability of organs to function, right? So the brain works because neurons talk to each other through synapses. Um, and then the ability of, of the organ to talk to each other makes functional bodies, functional people, right? So we depend on the interaction with our organs. Uh, and then ultimately also the interaction of people makes possible communities and kind of higher uh, order human endeavors. So there's flow of, it, of information. What I showed you, especially with the mouse study, that if you perturb the mitochondria, you influence the cells, you influence the organs, right? And you influence, at least in mice, how the organism um, behaves, right? Uh, internally, physiologically. There's also the flow of information the other way around, 
right? So it's not a unidirectional process. I think <laughs> in biology and a lot of sciences, you know, we like to draw models with causal uh, causal connections between boxes and ideally it's it's a, a one-way arrow so the model is much more simple and, and you can test it and <laughs> perturb it and so on the biological reality is that there are very few things that are unidirectional especially if you, when you look at complex systems so seeing this as a, as a network or as a nested layer is i think productive um, and what i'm going to show you for the the next few minutes is evidence that we've uh, gathered over the last three four years that there's information flowing from the human level you know, down to the mitochondria and how mitochondria might respond to psycho psychological states in, in humans. So one way that we think about this is, um, is that experiences in psychological state trigger uh, systemic biomarkers. And that's fairly well established. There's like a, a 20 plus year literature on inducing psychological stress in, in humans, healthy women and healthy men. And then asking what happens in the blood to, to inflammation, for example, because uh, it's well known that chronic stress suppresses the immune system. So you're more likely to get a cold or uh, you wound heal more slowly under during psychological stress. There's a, an old literature on this that's uh, very convincing. How does that happen? Right. So people to understand this have been asking questions about uh, social support and psychological stress and you know, other things like physical activity, environmental exposures, diet, and how that influences processes in the organism. And what's emerging in the last few years is that mitochondria contribute molecules. They can actually send stuff into the bloodstream. Uh, and one thing we've been very interested in doing is to map, right, what are the signals that come from mitochondria that are released in the blood? And maybe some of those signals are released very quickly and then they, they, return, they, they go away. Maybe some of them take a long time. Um, so there's nothing about this that's mapped, practically nothing. Uh, but there's these kind of trajectories are well mapped for cortisol, for markers of inflammation like interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, IL-1-beta, and so on. And something that we know very little about is what happens over time, right? From day to day, from week to week, month to month, over years, how do mitochondria change and how do they uh, adapt over time? So I'm going to tell you and show you some data related to this. So one of the first questions we tried to ask is, is mitochondrial energy production capacity, right? So the ability of mitochondria to make energy related to psychological states. And that question was made possible by a collaborator of mine in San Francisco who did a study with chronic, uh, chronically stressed caregivers. So these are mothers who care for a child with uh, a neurodevelopmental disability and then you know the child requires a lot of care it's very stressful for the mom uh, so then the, and you can quantify this and you can look at depression levels and chronic you know, subjective stress you can look at stress hormones uh, and confirm right that this is highly stressful so they did a study where they collected blood cells from those mothers at different time points um, and then one of the component of their study was women were going at home and then every day they were collecting a, a detailed diary of their emotions and then for for a whole week seven days in a row uh, and then on the middle uh, on the middle of the week on day four they would come to the hospital and give blood uh, so that was so at some point i spoke with Elisa, my collaborator and she said yeah we have these that like we have blood cells and we have mood psychological states collected before and after could you do something with this and then, then we thought, oh yeah, that would be interesting. But in order to do this, we had to have a good measure, a good way to, to quantify energy production capacity in blood cells. So we developed a platform. I'm gonna skip through this for, for time. We developed a platform where we could measure mitochondrial health in blood cells. So you can isolate white blood cells. There's a number of them in the blood. They have mitochondria. In the mitochondria, you see this respiratory chain, which is where the, the action happens. Uh, electrons are coming come from the nutrients and they're injected through the TCA cycle beta oxidation to complex one and two and then to three and then to four, which is where oxygen is used. And then complex five makes the ATP. So in the lab, we developed good assays to quantify the activity of complexes two and four, which makes energy. And then two markers of mitochondrial content. How many mitochondria are there per cell, which is an enzyme that's in yellow in the Krebs, the TCA cycle, and then the mitochondrial DNA. 
So we measured these four things, and then we thought, oh, maybe we could put them into a formula. So we take the mean centered values for energy production capacity, we add them up, and then we put them as a numerator. And that's going to tell us kind of a, an integrated index of energy production. And then let's divide this by how many mitochondria there are. So if you have someone who has very few mitochondria, let's say two units of mitochondria and 10 units of energy production. So that's 10 divided by two, you get a mitochondrial health index, MHI of five. Uh, another person might have also 10 units of energy production, but their mitochondria don't work quite as well. So the, the mitochondrial content, the denominator, let's say is 10. So 10 divided by 10, then you get an MHI of one. So then you compare someone with MHI of five versus MHI of one, which reflects the energy production capacity on the per mitochondrion basis, right? So then we could apply this. Uh, and then this is how Elissa and her team measured psychological states. So this is a questionnaire people have. And then it says for each of the emotions listed below, please tell us how much you felt that emotion this evening. And that's something people do after, after um, dinner, you know, before bedtime. And then, what is the most amused, fun-loving, uh, fun and silly you felt? So in blue here are the positive things, right? Awe, wonder, amazement, grateful, appreciative, thankful. And then the red is like the, the negative valence items, angry, irritated, annoyed, ashamed, humiliated, disgraced, and so on. So you can imagine on every particular day, you're gonna feel more of something and then less of some other things, right? And there are people who feel more of some things all the time, but there's still day-to-day -day variation and how people feel. So what we try to do is to ask how people feel and based on these measures, is this related to mitochondrial function? And that's the design, right? I told you it was a whole week of assessments. And then in the middle on day four, we were able to measure the mitochondria with this MHI. Um, so then we ask if we take the mood measures across the whole week. So some people feel more positive, some people feel more negative. Do they have different mitochondria? But then because there's measurements before and after, you can ask a spatially resolved, a temporally resolved question. You can ask, is the mood, so the psychological state before, the three days before, predictive of mitochondrial function? Or is it the mitochondria that predict how people feel three days after? So by breaking this down like this, uh, this is the result. You know, first of all, positive emotions were positively correlated with the MHI. Right? So the x-axis here is the effect size, it's the correlation coefficient. So you can see for the week average is correlated about R of 0.2 with the mitochondrial health index. If you take just the three days before, the correlation is about 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.3. And if you take the days after, do mitochondria predict mood after, then that's non-significant. And negative mood is negatively correlated, right? So people who felt more negative emotions had poorer uh, mitochondrial health index. So that's if you measure, if you take the mood measures in the morning. I told you this questionnaire was done at night, uh, but it was also done in the morning. So this is resolved for the morning. This is the result at night, right? So at night before going to bed, people who felt more positive in the three days before, here the effect size you see is about 0 0.3, 0 0.25. Uh, and the negative mood was non-significant, but going in the expected direction. So you can break this down also by, by day. So here the x-axis are the sampling days, and then the y-axis is the effect size. So you can see as you get closer, more proximal to the mitochondrial measure from day one to day two to day three, you see that the, the yellow and the orange lines, right? This is a positive mood. The effect size actually climbs, right? So the predictive power increases the more proximal you are to the mitochondria. And then if you measure the mood, the same day that you measure the mitochondria, there is no association, right? And the mitochondria predicting future mood, also no association. And negative is kind of all over the place. So and you can break this down by tertile also and just say, so people who feel more positive, people who feel more negative, and roughly, uh, you know, that's, that's what this shows. People who feel more negative, they have lower MHI. People who feel more uh, positive have higher MHI. This data, if you interpret it, and you look at the R square, the proportion of explained variance shows that previous day mood accounts for 10 to 15% of the variance in the mitochondrial health index. This, <laughs> this was uh, a little surprising and also the first evidence of a connection somehow between the mind and the mitochondria, right? That what we feel 
might actually reach the subcellular level that influence mitochondrial function. And, and now we've still since extended this and um, refined their mitochondrial phenotyping in the mitochondrial health index to single cell to um, uh, individual cell subtypes. So not all the white blood cells, but the monocytes, the lymphocytes, the CD4, CD8, naive memory cells, and, and so on. Um, so yeah, we'll be doing more of this. So now uh, into a, a second question, we wanted to know, do mitochondria signals send stress signals systemically, right? So I told you about mitochondrial function inside the cell might be affected by psychological states. Now, what about mitochondrial signaling? Uh, and there's this entity in the blood called circulating cell-free mitochondrial DNA, uh, and it's abbreviated CFMT DNA. And as the name implies, <laughs> it's mitochondrial DNA that is outside the cell, is not contained within the cell. And that's very contrary to what the textbook you know, will tell uh, your students. The <laughs> mitochondria is supposed to be inside the cell, just like I told you at the beginning uh, of this presentation. But it, this is here now we're pe peaking inside the, the human vasculature, inside the circulation. And you see at the bottom there, these big endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. And then inside is like the liquid fraction. And you can recognize a red blood cell, platelets that do coagulation, that have mitochondria, leukocytes have mitochondria, the white blood cells. And then there's this, these little vesicles, uh, the endothelial derived microparticles or extracellular vesicles. There's also exosomes. So there's kind of a whole literature on this in the cancer field and now in other areas. But the bottom line is there is mitochondrial DNA somehow circulating outside of cells in the blood. And I told you earlier that the mitochondria used to be bacteria. Yeah? And the mitochondrial DNA is a plasmid. It's a circular piece of DNA. Human cells are equipped with DNA receptors. And they're equipped also to sense if there are bacteria around. Uh, and there is this whole notion in the literature that we're increasingly skeptical of, but that says mitochondrial DNA could be pro-inflammatory. And, and maybe when it's released in the bloodstream, it triggers inflammation. So what we wanted to know is, well, is this induced by psychological stress? Because like I mentioned earlier, a single bout of acute psychological stress, where you bring in someone who's healthy, you say, okay, now you're going to deliver a speech and you're going to be evaluated. And here, here's the judging panel. People very serious wearing white lab coats that are going to judge your performance in this, in this mock job interview. <laughs> very stressful. People get stressed out. Over the next hour to two hours, there's actually increased inflammation in the blood, right? Just from psychological stress. How is the stress transduced, something you perceive in your mind, transduced into increased level of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood? So far, nobody knows. And then we thought, oh, maybe, maybe it's because the stress affects the mitochondria. Then the mitochondria release their DNA. And then the DNA inside the blood triggers the inflammation. And that could explain why the inflammation is delayed. It doesn't come like right away with stress. It comes an hour to two hours later. So these are the premise. Psychological stress increases systemic inflammation. We've known this for about 20 years. Cell-free mitochondrial DNA may be pro-inflammatory. Therefore, maybe that's the missing link, right? Stress to mitochondria to inflammation. So we have another collaborator in Pittsburgh who had samples stored from an old study that they had done before where they exposed people to five minutes of psychological stress, this public speaking task. And then they had collected blood before the, the, the stress and then after. So Caroline, a postdoc in our lab, asked this question. Could it be that mitochondria release a cell free mitochondrial DNA into the blood? Uh, so this is what happens before the stressor and then after the stressor. This is here you have the score of the profile of mood states, the POMs, for anger and anxiety. So you can see after the, this uh, forced public speaking, <laughs> people get anxious quite a bit and people get angry a little bit. Um, so can, that was validating the, the, the psychological manipulation. And then we asked in the, in the serum, what happens to cell-free mitochondrial DNA? On the left here is every line is a, is a person, right? So you see before the stressor, pre, post is immediately after, and then 30 minutes later. And then on the right is just the, the group average, the mean and the, the SEM. So I think what you can appreciate is that one, 
people that have pretty different cell-free mitochondrial DNA levels, right? So there's kind of a, a lot of noise. Uh, but then <laughs> there's a massive elevation 30 minutes after psychological stress in cell-free mitochondrial DNA. And a beautiful part of this design is that everyone came back a month later for a second session. And then they were told, you know, the first time you came, you performed a little below average. So we'd ask you to try a little harder. <laughs> Because if you don't do this, then people will say, oh, yeah, I got this. I did this a month ago, right? But introducing that little element just amplifies the, the signal a little bit. This is what happened <laughs> a month later. So this, you know, confirmed, just validated, right, that this was real. And maybe the, the procedure for drawing blood maybe was a little better. So you can see the pre-time point is a little cleaner. And, and there's this one person that had elevated levels, right? The same person a month, ago, a month earlier also had elevated levels. So this told us psychological stress is sufficient to trigger the release of cell-free mitochondrial DNA in the blood. Uh, and around the same time, as we were submitting this paper, another paper came out that was showing pretty much exactly the same thing with psychological stress. So kind of making us even more confident that this is real. Uh, what does cell-free mitochondrial DNA look like in the blood? And Jeremy, a student in our lab, is looking at this with electron microscopy. And all of these things you see here uh, the, in, in each panel, these, the, these are things that circulate in the blood. And these are very tiny, much tinier than a white blood cell or even a red blood cell. And all of these things are things that potentially contain mitochondrial DNA. So now we're actively trying to understand uh, what is this cell-free mitochondrial DNA? What does it do? Uh, and after about two years of work on... To, on this hypothesis that cell-free mitochondrial DNA might be the missing link through infl for inflammation, um, we're probably, I'd say, 20% confident that it's not the case. Um, yeah. So I'll just, um, for the sake of time, I just had a few more things. I'll just summarize. So what I've told you is how critical Right, the energy that mitochondria produce is to life. And uh, I think we're discovering the mitochondria are a lot more complex in their behavior. And I, uh, maybe the best model we can come up with is not kind of a, a ball and chain or kind of a mechanical model of mitochondria, but a more uh, ecologically valid model of mitochondria as social organelles. Um, I showed you how dynamic mitochondria are, that they produce hormones and uh, that they can change and regulate physiological responses in a whole organism. And I told you about the mitochondrial response to psychological stress uh, in humans, which needs to be replicated and validated and extended in, in, in multiple ways. Uh, and then I told you about the inducibility of a mitochondrial signal, a systemic mitochondrial signal uh, in response to psychological stress. And some data that I didn't show, but the signal is also detectable in human saliva. So the cell-free mitochondrial DNA is present in saliva, and we just found this uh, and uh, submitted a, a preprint on, on that uh, that I think is going live today. So in, in summary, I think there is much to gain by uh, adopting an energetic perspective, right? An energy-based or bioenergetics-based view of how different layers of biological organization interact with each other and, and thinking about communication. And these are the people in our lab that are doing the work now. Um, very proud of, of the team. And our most recent new addition here, and it was going on two years. Uh, and these are amazing collaborators that have made this work possible. I mentioned Elissa, uh, who led the, the study on caregivers and chronic stress, where we did the MHI work. Anna Marsland and Brett Kaufman in Pittsburgh are collaborators, where we did the Cell stress induced cell free mitochondrial DNA in the blood. And the, the team at the bottom is the team uh, that's the investigator team that's doing the human translation of the mouse work that we're currently working on. And most of our work is funded by NIH um, and, um, and uh, made much enjoyable by our, our collaborators. So if there's a few minutes, I know, you know probably many of you have meetings to go to, but if there's a few minutes, I, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Martin. I guess we can give you a bit of a virtual clapping.
to uh, as a show of appreciation. Uh, we we have a few messages. Uh, people had to rush off. Thanks for a very interesting talk from David Boulding. Very interesting talk from Pramod. Um, and another message from Katarina. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, so, are there any uh, questions from uh, those of us here? I'd love to ask a question if I can jump in. Um, thanks for a fantastic talk, Martin. That was um, incredibly informative. I know nothing about biology and now I feel like I'm an expert from listening to you, so <laughs> thank you. Um, this is, uh, I'm a psychologist and I study emotion, so I was really interested to see the last yeah. few studies that you talked about. And um, this might be a little left field, this question, but I wondered if you could say what you think about uh, emotions other than stress. So you, you talked um, a bit about, you know, different measures of emotion in daily life and or, or it doesn't really matter if they're in daily life or other measures. Um, and I wondered whether you think, you know, what's going on in the, in the brain and the body from your perspective, when people are experiencing say positive emotions, is it just the opposite of stress? Is it just a lack of stress or is it something different? Yeah, I think it's something different. And, um, so that's something we're actively investigating now and uh, our study where we, we look at um, mitochondrial regulation of stress reactivity and physiological reactivity, I should say, in humans. We have about 30 questionnaires in that uh, study that is kind of sprinkled across three different days and kind of uh, phases of the study, not to overwhelm our participants and to maintain kind of the validity of, of the measures and the, um, the scales. Uh, but yes, we're at this point, I, I don't think we can, uh, at this point, I think it's the most likely um, um, interaction between mitochondria and, and kind of psychological states is that positive psychological states and negative psychological states are not kind of, uh, um, are not mirror of each other, right? And I think it's, it's quite likely, I think the, the, the caregiver study with the chronic stress and the yeah. NHI shows that positive mood is driving the effects, not the negative, um, yeah. negative mood and negative valence stuff that would be, you know, more closer to stress. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, the strongest signal was with positive mood and not so much with other stress me measures that we had in the study. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about when I asked the question. Yeah, that was fascinating. So, look, I look forward to to seeing yeah, more about that work. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess. I can read out a question from Joe in the chat. Uh, that was fascinating. Are you aware of any specific work in people with depression or other mental illness? Yes, there's in the last few years, there's been quite a few studies um, and we've collaborated with people who study major depressive disorder. Um, and one of the studies uh, that we were part of uh, from our colleagues at UCSF and um, Sweden uh, is that show that the cell-free mitochondrial DNA, this molecule that we saw was signal from mitochondria that's induced with acute psychological stress, they found that it's higher just at baseline uh, in people with major depressive disorder and also people who after um, they attempted to commit suicide. So su suicide attempters, which has to be highly psychologically stressful. So there's kind of a, a deep connection there between I think mental health and, and mitochondria uh, and maybe more specifically, maybe mitochondrial signaling. Um, so that's you know part of the piece of the part of the puzzle um, that um, I think connects energetics and, and mental health and, and psychological, you know, well-being and, and and stress. Good question. It was um, James or, or Pauline? Pep, were you waiting to ask the question? Um, I, I'm happy to uh, ask the question. Yeah. Thanks, Martin, for for a great great talk. Um, at one point, I think you were describing a, like a sort of a, a mitochondrial health index, and it was sort of, it seemed to be related to the abundance of, of, of mito, mitochondria. I was wondering whether, is the diversity important as well? So if you have a diverse set of mitochondria, would that be something that if you measured it would, would, would reveal, would reveal interesting things? Yes, that's a great question. Every cell type in the organism pretty much has different type, qualitative, qualitatively different mitochondria. Uh, and that's because mitochondria subserve different purposes in different cells, right? Some cells that 
need most energy, their mitochondria are geared and optimized to make a lot of energy, not so much to make steroid hormones. And then the mitochondria, the adrenal glands are specialized for, for steroid hormone synthesis. So the proteome, uh, which tells us basically what the, the collection of proteins tells us what the function of the organelle is or gives us good insight there. And they're very different. The mitochondrial proteome of different organs is very different. Uh, and then in, in the white blood cells also, we found in a recent study we did that the mitochondria of T cells and B cells and monocytes and neutrophils, very different. <laughs> so now we're, we're moving our studies away from the mixed white blood cells, the PBMCs, to more specific cell types. Uh, and I think that might, you know, it, it's possible that the, the effect size that we estimated from our mood to psychological stress study, the 10, 15 percent, might have been underestimated uh, because we were looking at, you know, a large mixtures of, of types of white blood cells. Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe I'll read out uh, Katarina's question from the chat. I'm very interested to know if any studies related to chronic regional pain syndrome and cell-free uh, mitochondrial-free DNA. Is that what MFT DNA stands for? I hope. Yeah, yeah. Um, MFT condition. is mitochondrial, yes. Um, yeah, we haven't looked at this. I'm not aware of any study that looked at pain and cell-free mitochondrial DNA. I think that would be super interesting. Uh, one of our collaborators, Tor Wager, who does uh, neuroimaging and uh, is, is a pain expert and part of uh, our uh, human study, that's the, the translation of the mouse study, uh, has uh, two different painful tasks. So we might have some, some insight into, uh, into a connection there between the mitochondria and the sensitivity or the response to, to pain. Um, and I don't think we'll be able to look at cell-free mitochondrial DNA in the context of pain, but that's, that's a really interesting idea. Yes, James? Um, just another, another question, if you've got time. Um, given the role of, of, of mitochondria on, on mood, an obvious idea seems to be to think about transplants of, of mitochondria um, from, you know, happy, happy, happy subjects to, you know, subjects who need a boost. But does that make sense? Um, has it, has it been tried, the sort of the transplant type idea? Yes, it is. Um, it's a, it's a highly discussed topic at the moment. There are companies that have been uh, put together for mitochondrial transplantation and mitochondrial supplementation. <laughs> uh, there's actually cool, you know, early stage clinical trials that were done and showing that if you isolate mitochondria from a muscle, you inject it in the heart of someone with a defective heart, you can actually help a great deal uh, and you know, impact survival. So those were start, small initial studies, but proof of concept uh, that, uh, yeah, improving the number of, of you know, good, healthy mitochondria might provide useful signals and or energy uh, that enhances adaptation or you know, resilience. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if in, you know, 10, 15 years, it's a thing you can do in the clinic um, and in the intensive care unit, you, you get, instead of a blood transfusion, you get a mito transfusion. <laughs> yeah, well, People are trying to inject it in the brain also in relation, in, in the context of Parkinson's and I think Alzheimer's to see if, you know, that can help things there. Thanks. Uh, I always feel it's a bit amazing the human body even works when I hear about the details of what's going on. It seems way too complicated <laughs> to, that we're even alive. It's just a bit of a miracle. Yeah, no, there's, yeah, there's some kind of, um, yeah, there, there's wisdom in the organism. Like everything works uh, as, as a unit and this clearly requires energy and computation in different ways. Um, and it, it seems like mitochondria play an important role in that. But yes, it is, it is pretty amazing. And <laughs> yeah. I guess um, maybe if there's any last round of any last question before we let Martin go, or, or we can let him go directly. Um, is it Joe or Pauline, perhaps? No? Okay. Oh, I have an old okay. question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we can uh, thank you again. It's a very illuminating talk, and um, glad yeah. you, you, you uh, joined us so late at night over there. <laughs> My pleasure. Okay.
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye-bye.